Hey folks, it's Lee Scoggins with The Absolute Sound. Uh, we're here today because uh, Valerio Acora is in town showing his wonderful Acora acoustics loudspeakers. Did I say that right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and we're here at a beautiful dealership in the downtown square Marietta called The Audio Company. And I've known The Audio Company folks for quite a while. And I said, hey, can I show up with my little ring light and shoot video? And so we wanted to understand a little bit more about these speakers. We've reviewed them, yes. we've liked them, but it's always good to talk to the founder on camera and find out uh, what the story is. So Valerio, we'll just start off with some basic questions if that works for you. Absolutely. So tell us about how you got into audio. What's, what started that? First and foremost, thank you for coming out. It means a lot to us that you're, that you're here this morning and taking the time to come here. Thank you. Um, sorry, repeat the question again? Yeah, so I, I just w wanted to know what brought you into audio. What was your initial experiences in the audio? I always grew world? up with audio. I loved the audio. Um, it was something that, that was and is very dear to me. Uh, I got into the audio industry at a very young age. I got uh -huh. into it at roughly 12, 13 years old and started off uh, with a fairly big company up in Toronto, which was Ava Electronics. They were kind enough uh -huh. to let a 12 year old come in and play with <laughs> these big audio systems. Uh -huh. They saw that I loved the audio system, so they let me play with the stuff that was back then, the big stacks uh -huh. uh, speakers, the quad speakers, the BMW 801s, the Alltech Model 19. I mean, all the stuff that was the really prevalent stuff back in the late 70s. And be beyond that, they let me help them set up the car stereo boards and start playing with the wiring and all that stuff. And it, it came that after six months or so, I was actually working for them, maintaining all the car audio equipment and setting up all the systems in the store. And But, I mean, the side part of that is I got to sound, listen to all these phenomenal systems back then yep. that... How else does a 13-year-old get to listen to all these things? So, so you had the bug early. Oh, absolutely. I had the bug incredibly early. But how did you go from getting the bug mm -hmm. to now producing these speakers and also building them out of granite? Okay. Well, take us through that journey and how you wound up here and how you got to the point where you're demonstrating to a bunch of audiophiles in Atlanta. Well, as, as, as the audio industry grew, we know, we know back in the 1940s and 1950s, you would go to a store, buy a driver, you would make your own cabinet, you would throw it in. Cabinet construction was not even thought about. I mean, that came, that came many years later. The same sort of thing happened to me working uh, or being at Ava Electronics. BMW is one of the products that was sold there. Uh -huh. And at that point, they introduced the Matrix cabinet. Uh -huh. And you I mean, that started catching the world that, yes, cabinets really did make a massive difference. So, I mean, the matrix cabinet, you heard it instantaneously when you heard a standard cabinet, and then you heard the matrix cabinet. You heard what a properly dampened cabinet can start to do. And being that my family business is the stone industry, I looked at it, I said, well, they're taking wood, they're putting some a lattice in there, they're putting some foam in there to try and stiffen the cabinet, a little mm -hmm. bit of bracing. It's like, why don't we just do this properly and bring it to the hardest material that we know, mm -hmm. which is granite. So I actually built my first granite speakers when I was 16 years old. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're all the way back. I knew what this was all capable of back then. Uh -huh. The fact was that it was not something that was commercially reproducible because of machinery and quality uh -huh. of machinery. When you build something for yourself, if there's a couple of, I mean, you have a chip, you have a cry, I mean, you have stuff that is not the most elegant. You say, okay, it's mine. I built it myself and you don't worry about it. When we go into, um, where we are now commercially, these things gotta be, as far as I'm concerned, perfect. The corners have to be beveled perfect. You can't really see the seams in these. It looks like it's one solid piece of stone. Yeah. That took years and years of developing machinery and techniques and tooling to be able to do this. And yeah. until that was ready, I'm not gonna release them. It's either right or it's not done. Yeah, it's very sculptural. You're Thank right, you. I can't, I'm sitting here right next to the speaker. I can't see any seams, but the bevels are pretty, um, I mean, I just don't know how you do that with stone. How do you? Are the bevels also there for sonic reasons? Oh, absolutely. As this, well, this, this whole cat, this whole speaker, the SRC. This is the SRC two. The SRC one, which looks exactly like this one, uh -huh. was my speaker built for me. So every property of it was done for sonic considerations. Okay. The cabinets, the way they look, 
Um, I mean, that was all because that, that was a way for me to get them into my family room. So my better half would allow me to have something <laughs> like this in my family yeah. room, which we have to realize that is part of our aesthetics when we live in, in a home. Mm -hmm. We want things to look nice. We don't want to have, uh, you know, I mean, things that are not attractive, and that's understandable. Yeah, these are very attractive. I think they're very sculptural. Thank you. How do you how do you put this thing together without you know giving any trade secrets? Drivers. How did you choose drivers? Uh, how have you wound up? How have you landed on this tweeter? Can you give us some insights into I, a little bit of the technology? I probably went through 30, 40, 50 different tweeters, probably a couple hundred different base drivers. Uh -huh. um, and you know, I mean, the first, all, these were always made first off in wood, in Baltic birch. Mm -hmm. We braced Baltic birch. Now, we did exterior bracing instead of internal bracing to try and get as close as we could to what the granite's actually going to sound like. Uh -huh. um, and you know, I mean, through the, through that, and again, this was for me as a hobby, more or less, and it took quite a few years um, to get to these ones, because the first ones I built um, in granite that we even looked at doing commercially was back in 1998. So we did, I already did have a foundation of what I knew would happen yeah. uh -huh. once I went to the next step. And I decided I wanted the ultimate pair of speakers in my home. And this is after owning many different brands, mm -hmm. uh, which are great. You know, I mean, there's, there's great speakers out there. There's no question about it. But each and every one of them didn't have a you know, I mean, I would take quality from one, a quality from the other. And I said, let's get something that is mine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, my wife looked at me and said, build them. You know how to do it. Take your time. You've got the, you've got the background. You've got the equipment. Yeah. Do what you've got to do. Yeah. So I, at that point, started testing all sorts of different drivers, products, uh, tweeters, base drivers, crossover parts, different ways to build a crossover, uh, alignment strategies. Like there's just so much that goes into it. Mm -hmm. But it, because it was a, for a love for me, mm -hmm. I didn't care about the time. So there wasn't an R&D budget, which limits a lot of things. Yeah. Now, you're relatively new. How yes. long have you been out there doing it at, at this point? I know I met you at a couple of the early shows. Uh, but I think the thing for me, just speaking mm -hmm. personally, you guys had a blockbuster show, I think it's safe to say, the Florida Audio Expo. You had a big room there. Mm -hmm. It's it also good marketing, you yep. know. Yep. You were essentially located. Yep. And I went in there, and I th you had these speakers there, Correct. right? Correct. It was these guys. It was a ginormous room. Yes. And I walk in, and they've got these speakers. And these are not small, but mm -hmm. they're not imposing in any way. Yeah. And you look at the size of the room, like, this is, this is how stupid I am. I'm like, this isn't going to work. You filled that room with space. Yes. And the speakers disappeared. Yep. And I remember particularly listening to, I think it was a Roger Waters track. Okay. It was, you know, the common demo from, mm -hmm. you know, Muse to Death, I think it was. And well, you played a number of tracks. So you had some jazz stuff that was really good. Mm -hmm. And it sounded like, you know, very lifelike, a lot of, uh, a real presence to the sound, which I that always gets me excited. Thank you. Uh, so... Um, but how long have you been around and, and, and I guess, you know, how did you get to that point in Florida where you sort of had that level of sound? Have you gone through a number of revisions on the speakers at this point? No, we, the, the first revision, like I said, most of the revision was done to build me, my, my main pair. We actually opened up in September, uh -huh. um, of 2018. And by okay. that point in time, the designs, the three designs that we decided to start with, we're ready to go. I didn't Definitely. want to put a product on the market mm -hmm. that had to be changed and revised and edited and and, and you know, I mean the, the 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 trial and error method that is used a lot of the times. Yeah, we I didn't have to use. I made sure that I, I mean, when I was back, I'm going to go back to '98 when I did this. I mm -hmm. looked at it. I looked at the financials that were going to be um, required in order to do this properly. Uh -huh. And I realized back then that it just wasn't for me. I was starting a family. Things were a little different. When I went in on this in 2018, I made sure that all of that was taken care of. The financials were taken care of so that I didn't have to do the compromises that a lot of us are forced when we start businesses. Yeah. So, Good. I mean, the, the speakers were ready to go at that point in 2018. All the, all the designs were ready to go. So, I mean, as long as we look like we just came on the market and just started, but that's not the actual truth. It's been 20, 30 years in the building in the background. That's what they say every overnight success was 10 years in the making. Exactly. Kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Audio Quest Zero Tech Analog Interconnects apply the best of every design element the company has developed in its 42 year history and introduce Zero Tech, which virtually eliminates distortion caused by impedance mismatches.
With AudioQuest Zero Tech Analog Interconnects, music becomes more relaxing and stimulating at the same time, more palpable and engaging than previously possible. Learn more at AudioQuest.com. Uh, Alright, so how sensitive are these speakers and what's like an ideal amplifier arrangement? Well, we've got some beautiful power statement amps from uh, my friend Kevin at uh, back. back. But uh, what, 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 what do you guys, how sensitive are the speakers and what these seems are, to these, work? These are 92 and 92.5 dB. Okay. Uh, efficient. Okay. Standard one watt. A uh, four ohm, uh, four ohm load. Uh -huh. They do not go below three. They do not go above 12. So okay. they're very simple for most amplifiers to drive. That was one of the design cricket, uh, uh, criteria was that it was a very easy speaker to drive. Okay. Okay. I, I'm very much of the. Um, I'm very much think that it's much easier to drive a car downhill than uphill. Yeah. So it's the same thing with a speaker. Why make an amplifier work harder? Yeah. There's great amplifiers <laughs> that can make a hard speaker to drive work incredibly well. Yeah. But now you start limiting what's available. By doing this and by making the speaker easier to drive. First off, we open it up to more amplifiers, mm -hmm. more equipment, and second off, generally, it's going to sound better when it's easier, when you're not pushing whatever's trying to drive it that hard. Okay. That makes total sense. Uh, what about other models in the line? What should uh, people that are viewing our video channel know about your, your the model lineup that you we have? We may have three models, and the three models were designed specifically to give you the same type of sound that you heard in Florida and you loved yeah. in different size rooms, because we don't all have a room like we're in right now, which is roughly a 20 by 40 foot room, mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean, which is 800 to 1,000 square feet, 800 square feet, fairly high ceiling, so let's call it almost a 1,000 square foot worth of, of airspace to fill. Mm -hmm. um, so we built the three models based not on better, best, we built it on room sizes. Okay. Our, our entry level stand mounts are generally designed for room from 80 to about 200 square feet, okay. which is your condo, your smaller apartment, smaller family room. Yep. The next model up will give you anywhere from roughly 100 to 150 square feet up to about 800 square feet. And then we have these guys that will do 400 to 2000 square feet. So regardless of what size room you have, you can have what we said, what it should sound like, but without overloading the room, without um, you know I mean having to, um, to to compromise? Okay. You can have a, you can have a small ten by ten room and have a massive enormous sound with that's been tuned for that size of a room. So proper bottom end, yep. proper extension okay. without overloading the room. I mean it would be yep. great to take these and try and put them in an eighty square foot room, but they're not going to work. They're going to overload the room. It's just not going to work. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's build. You know I mean my wife wanted something for our bedroom, hence I built something for our bedroom. Uh -huh. It's that simple. And you have a mid-level model then before the SRC2s? There's the SRC1s, which again are exactly like these guys. Uh -huh. It's just missing one of the bass drivers. The okay. second bass driver is really here <coughs> to augment the lower end frequencies okay. so that it can fill a bigger room like Florida. Florida Florida was a 45 by 65 square foot. Yeah, it was big. Right. It, <laughs> it, it was, was really a, big. It was a big room, but we filled the room with ease. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, the main property of the granite, the reason why we use granite is, yes, step one is to get the uh to stop the cabinet from resonating that's step one and it's very important but step two is this driver moves back and forth it generates energy waves mm -hmm. whatever the basket itself is putting back into the cabinetry mm -hmm. slows down that driver i mean for every act for every force in action there's a reverse and opposite action yeah yeah exactly. okay so the stronger we make the cabinet the less compressible it is the more energy we get out it's the same thing like you driving down the street or driving a car always on a beach and you push the gas pedal and the wheels spin and you go nowhere. Right. You put it on asphalt, you're going to say, oh my God, what a difference. Yeah, exactly. And that's how we get so much energy right. out of these speakers. That's a good analogy. I like that. All right. So um, how low do they go and how high do they go? What's your, what's your frequency response? They go, like? they go from 29 hertz uh -huh. flat uh -huh. up to 40,000. Okay. okay, now there are peaks, and I mean, there's a breakup on the tweeter after 40,000. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I mean, you're always going to get that on, on all the tweeters. Exactly. Now, we do actually calm that peak as well. Uh huh. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're 29 to 40,000. Okay. Um, I talked about Florida that the speakers disappeared in the room. Yes. But I'm going to be generous and give you some time to do some marketing here. Okay. Me. 
Why you. should I buy your speakers? I can go find other speakers that disappear, but mm -hmm. you have, you said you've tried a lot of brands of speakers, yes. and you had, as an audiophile, yes. you had certain priorities and things you wanted to do better or as best as you can that really floated your boat. What would you say are the top three or four characteristics of these speakers in terms of what, you're, what, what you like in sound, what you wanted to hear that maybe you weren't quite getting in some of the other speakers? What do these do well, in other words? They do everything incredibly well. So there's nothing they don't do well. Okay. okay. Um, my design for a speaker, and it's our tagline, is hear the truth. And it really is. The speaker should come out of the way. It should be you come in and you hear music. And you alluded to that, to, to that before. You walked in the room and you heard music. Yes, they disappeared. But it was yeah. musical. It was dynamic. It sounded real. Yeah. And that's what it all comes down to. And that was the whole goal out of this. Because, you know, I mean, if we go back to, 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 to other speakers, we take a pair of quads and they're great. They disappear. And they're, they're, they have a texture and musicality. But get three people in the room and stop listening to the quads. And dynamics, they're, they're lacking. So, yeah. I yeah. mean, so that, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's like trying to get all of those together. But at the end of the day, it's all about the reality of music. We yeah. need to forget that all this equipment exists yeah. and just listen to the music. Yeah. Once we achieve that goal, now we've achieved the goal of the audiophile or the, the, go, the goal of the music listener. And I'll share my biases, but mm -hmm. I, I think the mid-range is really important. I think the mid-range is where the heart of the music is, and mm -hmm. that has a tendency to draw you in. Yes. You know, I work a lot with uh, my friend Jim Smith, who does room setups and mm -hmm. acoustics and really fine, super detailed setups. Yep. And he talks about getting things set up and having the equipment where it's immersive, where it's engaging. You're engaging with the music, and you just forget about the equipment. Exactly. And so, to me, the, the mid-range, but I also heard that, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be a commercial, but if I'm no, speaking no. candidly, I also heard some pretty super high-quality mid-range when I was listening to the, uh, the cuts at the Florida Audio Absolutely. Expo. So, to, to me, that's kind of a, an, Im, an important thing. Um, let's talk about high frequencies. Okay. All right, so you went through a lot of tweeters. Yes. What were you looking for? What was your what's your general design uh, philosophy on getting that tweeter right? Is there anything I, we should know in terms of? No, it's it's again it's all back to being natural and musically correct. So I mean, like an effortless sound. Effortless, but dynamic at the same point in time without hiding things. You know what I mean? Yeah. There there is the rule of do no wrong, and you know what I mean don't make anything. Uh, as long as uh, you can be missing stuff, but not don't bring anything out. I don't yep. believe in that. It, everything should be there. The second we put a veil or a cloth in front of something, yeah, to say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna dampen this down just a little bit so it's not offensive, you just lost something. Yeah. So it, for me, it really is the most revealing, most dy dynamic, most truthful. I mean, not everything. I mean, there's a lot of recordings out there, and there's a lot of instruments out there, and that are aggressive. And if they should be aggressive, a trumpet should be aggressive. It shouldn't be a muted, polished right. sound. That takes away from the music. That takes away from the enjoyment. Yeah. So if you're going to design a speaker, you're going to design equipment that's going to be overly warm and overly, overly uh, forgiving, yeah, it's going to sound better on a lot of stuff. But you're going to miss a lot of magic that makes music, what, what, what makes us be drawn into the music yeah. the way we are. I agree. Well, this has been really... Uh really helpful i feel like i understand your speakers a lot a lot better thank you um thanks for coming to atlanta allowing us to sit down and, and interview you and uh, uh th thanks also to the audio company and their great facility here uh many thanks to my friends uh keith jim and gordon for that and um we're i'm, I'm anxious in, a, in a, an hour or so to hear the uh the official uh, demo here perfect thank in, you in atlanta Thank you again for coming. Very, very happy you're here, sir. My pleasure.